All right, in this video, I want to talk about the exact timing of the rapture of the Christian church. And the answer is, it doesn't matter. It doesn't. I see a lot of people talking about the rapture being soon, and I agree. It looks like we're right at the end. No matter how you're looking at it, we're at the end. But people thought that many times before. And it's kind of hard to pinpoint things down when you're using the years and everything. And the calendars and the changes. You know, it, It's probably one of the reasons why we're told we don't know the day or the hour. It might be something hard to... To figure out. Not saying that we wouldn't end up actually knowing the day and hour. We might know the day uh, when we wake up. God reveals it to us in some way that we just know that today's the day. And we just have this something inside of us compelling us to go look up and to, and to wait. We're like, something's going to happen. We know it. It's something. And it happens. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if something like that happens. But ultimately, it doesn't matter when. It doesn't matter if it's today, tomorrow, next year, or in a hundred years. Right? It doesn't matter. If you really think that the rapture soon, well, get out there and get the gospel up. And the people who don't want to hear the gospel, let them know that the beast is coming in his mark. You won't be able to buy or sell without it. And if you accept it, you're damned. Let them know that you can be saved by accepting what Jesus Christ did for you. He lived a perfect life in the flesh so that he can exchange that life with yours. So that by faith, you can die for your sins and your sinful nature on the cross 2,000 years ago in Jesus Christ. And by faith also received his perfect life that he lived in exchange. So that you may be saved by his life, by his works, by his mercy and his grace. But if you're going to reject that, well, the mark of the beast is coming. And if you accept that just so you can have a comfortable life, you, you can continue with your education and your career, your business and making money and having food, water and shelter. Well, then you're going to lose your soul. You're going to be damned. Because you would rather have the temporary comforts right now than to deal with some discomfort temporarily to enter into eternal pleasure with God. Instead, you're like, no, I want it now. You give in. Well, you just traded your soul for that. Not worth it. Not worth it at all. This what is actually needs to be, be doing. Eh. This is what we actually need to be doing right now. And ultimately, the main thing we should be doing is just praying and reading the scriptures. Not that, that you're doing that without ceasing, without eating and drinking, and without doing your job and taking care of your body and your family and whatever your duties are, your responsibilities. But there is times where you would, you should do that, where... You fast and you get away from everything and that's all you do is focus on God and praying to him and praying for whatever's on your heart to pray for and who to pray for. And just get into that and your relationship with God, with God will build and you don't even realize how he's changing you and how he's reflecting his light off of you and how he's influencing other people 
and he's doing things through you that you don't even realize. So that's ultimately, ultimately what you need to be doing, right? Getting to know God and he gives the increase. That's it. It's all about him. So just look to him, get to know him, and pour your heart out to him. And that should be your focus. Because just like Paul talked about the gift of tongues with the church, and he told them, I would rather speak five words that people can understand than 10,000 words in a language people can't understand. He's like, imagine if the church had everybody speaking in tongues and the people outside would come and just think we're mad because everybody's just blah, 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 blah. And there's churches that do that. And guess what? You think they're mad. They're, they're crazy. Right? And not that God doesn't give the gift of tongues. But he's saying that's not a gift that you should be striving for. That's, I mean, yeah, ask for that if you need to speak to people in different languages. But what's the benefit of that? Who does it benefit? No one. No one, really. Not in the situations that people want to use it. They just want to go blah, 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 blah while they sit in church. Who does that help? Who's being helped by that? By you just blah, 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 blah. Who? Nobody. Right? In this same way, how does constantly saying, oh, the rapture is tomorrow. How is that actually benefiting anybody? And I know they're not literally saying it's tomorrow, but they'll be saying, oh, this next up upcoming feast, appointed time here, that's the rapture. And these are reasons why. And they'll keep going into it. Who, who's that benefiting? Because the, the people outside the church, they're looking at all the people saying, oh, the rapture's at this time, at this time, at this time, at this time, at this time. So what do they think? Oh, it's just like you speaking in tongues. You're mad. You're crazy. But if you are actually getting into the word, getting to know God, he's going to be bringing you into correct doctrine and heightening your discernment to discern everything so that you can see through all the BS. So that you're, you're going to be refined and you'll be able to clear out all the, the chaff, all the little nonsense that people cling to and you'll you can separate from that and you can start becoming a, a truly peculiar people giving out light and actually edifying the church with right doctrine and getting the gospel out to the world instead of saying hey the rapture's coming and then it doesn't come you're pushing more unbelievers away than bringing them in and anybody that you are bringing in by preaching the rapture and not the gospel, you're bringing false converts in who are just hoping to escape what's to come. They don't truly believe the gospel. They're not truly saved. They just don't want to be here for what's to come. And they think that if they just sing some praises to God and go to church and hang out with Christians, they'll be taken too. So our focus shouldn't be on the rapture because it ultimately doesn't matter if it's anytime soon. It really doesn't. It shouldn't have any effect on our lives. It shouldn't. And the fact that it's having this much of a, an effect on Christians shows that we are still very self-centered and we're looking at ourselves. And I know Christians tend to do this a lot because a lot of Christians don't even believe the gospel where they're focused on what they do for God, not what God does for them. Well, in this same way, 
Christians who believe the gospel are still self-centered and they're thinking, oh, finally, I'm going to go home. I'm going to escape everything. And they're focused on themselves and them getting out of here. When that should not be your focus. I mean, I, I don't understand why it is. The whole teaching of the rapture is to comfort you, not that you're going to be raptured before anything bad happens to the world or anything bad happens to you. It's that everyone who has died in Christ is going to raise again. And that if you die in Christ, you will be raised again. That's the comfort, is that you don't have to fear death. Because what does it matter if you were to die today and the rapture is tomorrow? What's the difference if you live today and you get to be alive when it happens? Whoop-de-doo. Is that something to hang your hat on? I think we're, we're getting way too caught up in this. So... Yeah, I was getting ready to make a different video, but I read somebody's comment and it, it triggered this. Uh, I added this to an end, something like this, to an end of a different video I did, just briefly talking about it. And I figured, you know what, I should just make a quick video focusing just on this. So, the exact day, hour, and moment of the rapture doesn't matter. It really doesn't. Yeah, hopefully it is today. If not today, then hopefully it's tomorrow. Maybe it's at a at a point a appointed time. What are the feasts like? The feast of trumpets. I would I would definitely think that would be a, a perfect day. But if it is or isn't, so what? It shouldn't change your life. It really shouldn't. And if it does, there's something off with your relationship with God. And your priorities are a little off. So, yeah. But, but the last thing I'll say to this is, uh, I guess, it's something a little bit positive. Because uh, it just rebuke you a little bit there. Is that everything works out for our good. So even when we do something stupid and God chastises us, it works out for our good because it's there for an example. Like Jonah, for example, he rebelled against God saying, no, I'm not going to Nineveh and was going to go his own way. He gets chastised. Seems like he died in that whale's belly and went to hell and then was thrown back up to preach to Nineveh, and that story shows us how God is and how he works, and that is to the glory of God, but it also shows that everything works out for the good of those who trust God, who know God, who are God's. Not that you are a God, but you are owned by God. That's what I mean by you are God's. You're his. Okay, I don't want people mistaking what I mean by that. So, even if your whole focus is on you getting raptured, and I think that's just, your priorities are off. Yes, I want Jesus to come today. I'm excited to see him. I am a bit of ashamed of a lot of things, but I know I'm saved by his love, his mercy, and his grace, and all that will be cleared up, and I won't have to worry about any of that anymore. I'll be washed away. I won't have memory of it, or even think of it, if I do have memory of it. And I won't have that desire to sin and go against him anymore. It's going to be a great day. There's nothing else to worry about. But... Even if he's not going to come until 500 years, I'm not saying he is, just saying, it shouldn't change anything about my life. But if my focus is just on that, hey, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, I think God's still going to use that because 
eventually we are going to be raptured. Eventually. And it looks like pretty soon. And I think that's a witness in itself. But I think if it, you, as long as you're doing these two things, preaching the gospel and preaching the mark of the beast, when you get raptured, you leave something, right? That, hey, you were trying to get them to accept God's grace and his mercy, but they wouldn't. But now they have to reject the mark of the beast. Right now, people may not listen to you because all you're doing is saying rapture, 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 and it's not happening. So they're kind of looking away. But then, boom, you get raptured. All of a sudden, like, whoa, whoa, what, what? They were talking about it and it happened. Then they might listen to what you're saying. But as long as you're leaving something for them, because if all you're doing is talking about the rapture, but you're not really getting into the gospel, what's the point of that? And even if you're getting into the gospel, what does that matter for those who are left behind? Gospel isn't going to going to apply to them because they're not going to be saved by grace through faith. So even if you're spending a lot of time preaching the gospel and talking about the rapture, what about the people left behind? You need to be talking about that mark of the beast and how it's going to damn your soul. Because I've talked to a lot of Christians who think that, that the rapture is sometime in the middle of the tribulation, but they call it some kind of post-trib pre-wrath rapture. They just change the name of it. And they act as though Christians are going to go through a little bit of the time of the issuing out of the mark of the beast. And that you could potentially take the mark as long as you're not actually worshiping the beast. That's kind of like saying, oh, you can be sealed by God, which is his mark, without actually worshiping him. Right? What You can't get the seal of God without believe in the gospel, which would lead you to end up worshiping God in the same way you can't take the seal or the mark of the beast without the same. Because just like when you believe the gospel, you are born again, you are a new creature, and you'll notice that you're different. The things you like are not the same anymore. They're changing. You don't have the same feeling you get from the music you used to listen to in the movies in the entertainment you would get into they're not the same they don't have the same appeal and other things start to have more of an appeal to you because you're a new creature in this same way the mark of the beast is going to change you it's satan's counterfeit to what god does i was actually going to do a video about how satan was going to counterfeit everything. And his counterfeit of being born again is this mark of the beast. Where you're born again, you're sealed, and you're saved. No matter what, he has a mark that's going to give you a new birth. But you can actually see it. It's not by faith. It's by sight. So you can actually take the mark. You can see it going into you, and it's going to change you. Where stupid people are going to become smart. You're going to know different languages because he's going to falsify the gift of tongues because of this implant that's going to be a mixture of something genetic and something technological, like some kind of nanobot thing that's going to change you. And it's going to seem like something super beneficial. Like, why wouldn't you take it? It's going to make you practically superhuman and probably promise eternal life because that's what you get from being born again by accepting the gospel is eternal life. He's going to promise you eternal life by accepting this mark of the beast. And since you don't have to go by faith, you can go by sight. It's going to be very, very appealing to our sinful nature that doesn't want to go by faith. That wants to go by sight. And once you take that, you can't undo it. Just like you can't be unborn again by believing the gospel. Once you're saved, you're saved. You can't be unborn again from the mark of the beast you can't be unmarked it's a done deal you made your choice right you're bound to that so even if you see the consequences of that you have to deal with those consequences you can't just turn from them you've agreed to it 
So whether you overlooked them or whatever reason you decided to take the mark anyway, because there's people like me warning you that your soul will be damned if you take it. Well, it's still, it's going to be on you for taking it. The eternal damnation. But like I said, there's Christians thinking, oh yeah, you could potentially take it because God would understand your heart. And uh, I've heard one preacher say that, oh, well, perhaps you just have to cut your hand off when, you know, you receive in your hand, you have to cut your hand off so that you'd be saved. It's like, that's not how it's going to work because this mark is going to in, infuse with you. So even if you cut your hand off, it's still part of you. It's just where you receive it is in your hand or in your forehead. It doesn't matter where. It changes you just like a snake bite. It bit you on the on the neck, on the arm, on the leg. Uh, you're still poisoned. It's infecting you. Right? Uh, but anyway... Uh, that's most important. If all you're going to do is talk about the rapture, talk about the mark of the beast. That's one of the things I'm not seeing too much of. Like some of these people preaching the rapture, they're preaching the gospel. And praise God, but not so much about the mark of the beast and how you're damned if you take it. You know, they might mention it here and there, but a real focus on that this thing is going to alter you. There's no hope left for you. You're going to enjoy momentary joy and happiness from receiving some new abilities and a new life, maybe some kind of enlightenment. But it's not going to last. And because you took the mark, you have no other choice but then to fight against God to try to save your soul. And in which case he ends up destroying you. Rightfully so. But anyway. There you go. That's the time. The exact time of the rapture. Right there. Doesn't matter. Thanks for watching. Take care. So that fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? So a fella didn't take the sacraments, didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary, didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe, didn't tithe. He went to heaven, he went to hell. You say? Didn't keep the law, he didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments, he broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule, he didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory, he woke up in the pit. Are you saved? You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest thy kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. Amen. It's like that. Yeah. You have been saved? Yeah. If you ever saved, you were saved like that. Yeah.